Well, thanks for having me again. Uh, I was here, when was it? Maybe six months ago. So to be invited back is a good thing. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm going to get to this topic of the royal priest in Psalm 110, but I'm going to get there by helping us to think through the entire message of the Bible. So really the goal today is that by the time you leave, you'd be like, okay, I know what the whole Bible is about. Do you think we can accomplish that in an hour? I'm glad there's a clock. Churches always have clocks in the back so that uh, the pastors you know, can keep their sermons timely. Uh, and I'm thankful for the clock. We'll try to stay on time. You have an hour 15 plus 15 for questions. There we go. So we have plenty of time. Um, longer than I preach. I always debate whether to use a PowerPoint or a whiteboard. This time I'm going with the PowerPoint. I like the whiteboard just to be able to draw stuff kind of on the fly. Uh, but we'll stick with the, the PowerPoint. And I think we should start by reading Psalm 110. And then we should pray and we'll get into the material. So if you have a Bible and you want to open to Psalm 110, you can follow along with me. I need to find it. Psalm 110, it's a short psalm, a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. In holy garments from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Let's pray one more time. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Psalm 110. Uh, we thank you that Jesus is our great high priest and our messianic king who is seated at your hand right hand right now ruling over the nations. And I pray that as we open up your word, you would give us wisdom, you would give us clarity of thought to understand these texts so that we might rejoice in the great salvation that has come to us. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Um, I was pushing my kids, well not all of them, I have six kids. I was pushing one of them in a stroller. This was a, maybe last summer and uh, just walking back from the park in the neighborhood, and I hear someone yell behind me, well, not yell, but ask loudly, hey, I'm supposed to ask you about Melchizedek. <laughs> so I turned around and there, it was a guy in the neighborhood who um, the backstory is had bumped into my wife at the park and he had a lot of kids, we have a lot of kids, and he started asking her questions, and she told him that I was a pastor in the area, and you know that I teach some classes, that I had written this book on Psalm 110 and Melchizedek, and he started asking her questions about it, and she said, like, I don't know, you just need to talk to him. And apparently he knew who I was. I don't think I had met him yet at this point, but everyone in the neighborhood knows who I am because I'm a pastor in the neighborhood and everyone knows where the pastor lives. And he saw me and he said, hey, I'm supposed to ask you about Melchizedek. And then he told me the backstory. But how many times and where else in the world will you have evangelistic conversations about Melchizedek? Only here in Utah, right? Um, this guy Melchizedek appears in two verses, well, three verses in the Old Testament. And then he's mentioned again in Psalm 110, and that's it. Almost never do people have evangelistic conversations about this guy Melchizedek, but I have regular conversations about him because, why is that? Well, most of our neighbors, worthy Mormon men 18 years or older, um, believe they hold the Melchizedekian priesthood and that it gives them certain uh, privileges and responsibilities in the church, right? And so it's a very unique place in which we live. And I think this is an important topic to be familiar with not just for apologetic reasons, but because it helps us to understand the whole Bible better. In fact, if you're familiar with D.A. Carson, New Testament scholar, he said in a sermon once that um, Melchizedek is one of the most important figures for helping us put our whole Bible together. 
And maybe that sounds like an overstatement, but I actually think he's right. If we understand who this guy is, what David was talking about in saying that the Messiah would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and then how his priesthood is fulfilled in Jesus, it helps us understand the framework of the entire story of the Bible. So I think it's important before we jump into Psalm 110 and this idea of priesthood that we understand what is the overall kind of message of the Bible and where does priesthood begin? Well, if I were to ask you that question, where does priesthood begin in the Bible, what would your answer be? Nobody likes to answer these questions because they always think it's a trick question. Uh, and if nobody wants to answer that, that's fine. Um, I think I heard the right answer. Is it bad that I don't know how to change my own slides in this presentation? Ah, there we go. So I read Psalm 110. Oh, there's the answer. All right, darn. Now you don't have to. Genesis. Yeah, you said somewhere in Genesis. Yeah, I know. Genesis or Exodus. Yeah, so a lot of people, when they hear priesthood, they think immediately of the tribe of Levi, the Aaronic priesthood, all of the kind of refined priestly duties that get um, fleshed out in the Mosaic Covenant. But priesthood in the biblical storyline actually starts in the garden, in the book of Genesis. And the first priest in the Bible is Adam. He's the first priest in the biblical storyline. He's the first king in the biblical storyline. He is the first son of God in the biblical storyline. And that's where people get a little squeamish. But Luke calls Adam the son of God. Okay, so if that's a little uh, 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 unsettling to you, I'm just taking that from uh, Luke himself, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, the genealogy of Jesus. Adam is the son of God. Obviously, he's not a ontological, right, eternal, divine son of God. There's only one unique son of God. Um, Aaron's going to go over this in the Council of Nicaea, right, the, the Trinity. But Adam is created to relate to God as a son relates to a father, right? He is in a covenant with God, and covenants create kinships. And so Adam is God's son. Um, made to represent God's rule in the world. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look at Genesis. This text in Genesis is super important for understanding the trajectory of the biblical storyline and how, how come priesthood and kingship are so important in Psalm 110 and a central figure. You're all familiar with this text. It's the creation mandate. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Let's read it. Then God said, you don't have to read it with me, uh, let us make man in our own image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So another important question, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And just ponder that, you don't have to answer. Um, but I think when people think image of God, people will typically think of, of certain attributes in a person uh, that are like God, so maybe love, compassion, uh, the ability to speak, to reason. Now, those things, I think, are tied to the image of God, but what does it mean in Genesis? That's the question, right? What does it mean to be made in the image of God in the book of Genesis? What does it mean in its ancient Eastern context? Well, I think it means two things, primarily. One of them I've already mentioned. Uh, rulership and sonship. So if you think about the ancient world, uh, we have texts from Egypt, for example, that talk about Pharaoh, the king, being made in the image of gods. He was the son of Amon-Re. So to bear God's image in Egypt was reserved for Pharaoh alone because he was thought to actually be the divine son of God on earth, the representation of Amon-Re, uh, his kind of living, breathing statue. When kings would go and conquer lands, 
how would they let everyone know in, in that land who rules the land? Well, you put up a big statue of yourself, right? And so in its context, in history, but also in the Bible, you see it right there in Genesis 126 through 28, God creates humanity in his image to do what? What did it say? And take what? Dominion, Dominion right? Rulership. That is kingship authority, right? And so God makes humanity in his image to represent his righteous rule on earth. God is king. His son is king, right? I always use this kind of silly illustration, but in the ancient world, and even often today, sons do what their fathers do, right? They, they did what their fathers did. If dad was a butcher, son was a butcher. If dad was a baker, son was a baker. If dad was a candlestick maker, son was a candlestick maker. If dad was king, well, what's his son going to be? King, king right? So God makes a, Adam in his image and says, take dominion over the earth. Over all of my creation, you are to rule. You bear my image. You relate to me as my son. You represent my righteous rule on earth. Go build my kingdom. So from the very kind of beginning of the biblical storyline, we get this trajectory that God's plan for creation is for a son, king, to build his kingdom, establish his kingdom over the earth. Go take dominion over it all. all right? That's how the whole kind of creation project gets started. That's where we start in Genesis 1. Then we come to Genesis 2. And I don't think I have a slide on this, but if you have a Bible, you can turn to Genesis 2. Um, here's a quote from Steve Dempster's book, Dominion and Dynasty. I'll go ahead and read it. There, thus, there is a deliberate anthropological climax in Genesis 1 with the creation of humanity as the image and likeness of God. In a deft literary move, with the use of these terms, the writer makes the goal of creation anthropological and thus doxological. Since to crown creation with the creation of humanity is firmly to stamp God's own image in the very heart of the created order, it is as if humanity is functioning as a type of priest-king mediating God to the world and the world to God. Now, we haven't really talked about uh, priesthood, but that um, comes up in Genesis 2. Okay, so we talk, I said Adam is the first priest in the biblical storyline. Where do we see that? We see that in Genesis 2. So if you have a Bible, you can look there. Um, you're familiar with the contents of Genesis 2. I have too many things in my Bible, so as they fall out, I'll just set them over here. Uh, Genesis 1 gives us the big kind of big picture 30,000 foot level view of creation. God creates the world in six days. Then in Genesis 2, it's as if we get another angle on the creation narrative and God, it's, the text slows down. Let me give you some of the details about the creation of humanity and that's what we get in Genesis 2. So how does God create Adam in Genesis 2? Well, he forms him from the dust, right? And breathes into his nostrils, the breath of life. And then he takes Adam uh, and he puts them, him in this garden. We read about this in, in verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So he hasn't created Eve yet. He's created Adam out of the dust. And he created Adam and put him in a garden. And I think a lot of times, you know, Christians, we read this and we just think, well, this is before uh, the advancement of technology, so Adam is just kind of this primitive uh, landscaper, <laughs> right? He's, he's a farmer uh, and uh, uh, he's doing the work of agriculture and things like that. There's way more going on here. Um, this garden is a special place, okay? Now, why is it a special place? Because there's really good fruit there. But why is it special? in Genesis? What makes it unique? It's a mountain yeah, right? I mean, God dwells there, yeah. right? And where God dwells, uh, that is a sanctuary, right? A temple sanctuary. So you get all these indications in Genesis and in later biblical texts that the Garden of Eden is the Bible's first temple. 
So if Adam is the first priest, where is the place where he does his service? Well, it's in the Garden of Eden, the first temple. And so you get these connections um, between the Garden of Eden and the tabernacle, for example. Um, um, oh, there's so much to say about the tabernacle. If you want to know more, come to my sermon tomorrow. Uh, I'm starting Exodus 25 on the furniture of the tabernacle. Okay, I'm just going to pause. We'll get to this. The Garden of Eden, read Ezekiel 47. When Ezekiel talks about the eschatological temple, the end time temple, he talks about it with the imagery of Eden. That's because Eden is the prototype, so to speak, the prototype of the temple. And God places Adam here to work and to keep the garden. The reason that language is important is because it's the same language that is used elsewhere in the books of Moses, the first five books, to describe the responsibilities of the priests in the tabernacle. They were to work and to keep the tabernacle. Right? They were servants in the sanctuary. You could, you could translate this word uh, to keep as to protect or to guard. So Adam's responsibility is to worship God in this sanctuary and protect the borders of this sacred space and not let who in, right? The unclean serpent, right? So Adam's priestly responsibility is to worship God, to obey God's command. Remember, God gave him a command, take dominion, uh, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He's to pass that truth on to his wife. He's to teach the law of God. He's to protect the boundaries of this sacred space from the serpent. So he's made in God's image as a son. He's to rule the world, and he is to minister in the garden as a priest. This is the job that God has assigned to humanity from the very beginning. I don't remember what the next slide is, so let's see what it says. And we'll... Oh, there's more uh, connections between the Garden of Eden and uh, temple kind of imagery. This last one is important. You, if you pay attention to the details of the narrative in Genesis, what you find is that the, you get this kind of tripartite structure to the garden. Uh, Aaron, Aaron said it's, it's, uh, the garden was on top of a mountain. We know that from Ezekiel, which refers to the Garden of Eden as Adam being placed there on the mountain of God. Mountains are really important in the biblical storyline. Um, you could actually tell the whole story of the Bible through mountains. Have you ever thought about that? Do any of you like hiking? Well, it doesn't matter. It's not about hiking. <laughs> it's about a place. Mountains are, are kind of these uh, uh, temple, natural temples in the Old Testament. So think about the biblical storyline. Adam is placed on a mountain as the place of meeting between God and humanity. Right? Then he's exiled from the mountain. He goes into exile into a world of death. Um, and then you get this new Adam figure in the narrative, which is Noah, whose boat lands on a mountain. And then Noah is given the commission to go out into all the world. And then from there, you get this fake mountain, Babel, where people try to ascend to God on their own initiative, false religion. But from there, then, you get Abraham in the mountain of Moriah, where sacrifice is made. Right? And then from Abraham, you get the people of Israel who go to Mount Sinai and meet with God at the mountain of Sinai. But Israel's history, we know, eventually comes to Mount Jerusalem, where David is installed as king. But then the people sin against God, and they go into exile of death again into Babylon. And then out of Babylon, God promises he'll bring them where? To Mount Zion. And guess what Hebrew says? You have come to Jerusalem above. So your whole salvation depends on mountains. <laughs> that could sound heretical. Don't take it too literally. You can tell the whole Bible story as one of uh, mountaintop experiences. Should you be seeking a mountaintop experience with God? Yes. It's biblical. <laughs> OK, so back to this tripartite structure of Eden. Um, the way the narrative presents the world at this time is you have this land of Eden. You have a garden, and you have the rest of the world. So there's three parts. The rest of the world, Eden, and the garden. Now, why does that matter? What else is a tripartite structure in the Old Testament? 
Well, that's true. what? Tabernacle. The tabernacle, right? What are the three sections of the tabernacle? You have the outer court, you have the holy place, and you have the holy of holies. You see? So Adam is a priest with access to the holy of holies, the very presence of God. But he's given this commission to take dominion over the earth and to work and to keep the garden. So G.K. Beale and others have pointed this out. As Adam is fruitful and multiplies, and as he takes dominion over the earth, what's going to happen? Well, his offspring and, and he himself are going to push the boundaries of this sacred space, this temple, into these inhospitable outer places of the world until the whole creation becomes the Garden of Eden. So that the whole world becomes the dwelling place of God and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. So Adam is not only a kingdom builder, he is a temple builder. See, that's everyone following with this trajectory so far? Adam, worship God, build the temple, take dominion over the earth, represent my righteous rule. And as these uh, image bearers multiply, God's living statue fills the earth. And everywhere you look and you see an image bearer, you're reminded Yahweh is king, right? And he rules the world through his sons. That's the trajectory of the storyline, but of course we know it all falls apart in Genesis 3. Well, at least kind of from our perspective it falls apart, not from God's perspective. He had it planned out all along. Adam sins against God and he is banished from the temple, right? He's a sinner now. He cannot go into the Holy of Holies. He cannot dwell with God on the mountain. He is defiled. And so God banishes humanity out of Eden and puts the cherubim with the flaming sword to guard the way back into God's presence, right? But now they are in the exile of death. Now they are outside of God's presence where they will experience thorns and thistles, which is why it's so hard to keep your lawn maintained. Oh my, I hate the weeds in my yard. <laughs> Uh, and you will experience death in exile away from the presence of God, right? Life is to be in God's presence. That is the ultimate desire of every Christian, right? It's not just to not have sickness and pain. It's to be in the presence of God. That is the height of our joy. But Adam is now banished and the cherubim guard the way back into this sacred space. Let's skip that temple or uh, that uh, uh, quote. Okay, so that's how the story starts. Now we're going to skip over Melchizedek because where does he appear? Does anyone know? Genesis 14. So he's, he appears not long after these early chapters of Genesis. We're going to skip over him for a second and think about priesthood now as it is developed in the Aaronic priesthood and the tabernacle and the Mosaic covenant. Okay, let's just kind of understand what a priest is under the law. Um, there's lots of texts we could look at to think through this. Uh, one of them is Exodus 24, which I just preached on last week. So the Levitical priesthood does not exist yet in Exodus 24, but here we get a kind of paradigm for what the priesthood is uh, as we consider Moses' role in Exodus 24. In, in summary, Exodus 24 is about uh, the confirmation of God's covenant with his people, Israel. Chapter 20 is an important chapter. What do you get in chapter 20? The Ten Commandments. Chapters 21 through 23 are important. What do you get in chapters 21 through 23 of Exodus? The Book of the Covenant. Here's how you are to live. So you get these ten words. And then you get all of these specific laws about justice and slavery and loving your neighbor, here's how you're to live. Then in chapter 24, you get the ratification, this establishment of the covenant between God and the people. It's a really interesting text. Let me just read a few verses from it. Exodus chapter 24. 
it starts this way, the first two verses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. So if you pay really close, and close attention to that text, you, you see that, okay, so there's three sections to Mount Sinai. There's the base where the people must stay. They must not touch the mountain, right? Moses and the elders of Israel, Nadab and Abihu, they're allowed to go halfway up the mountain. But who alone is allowed to ascend to the top? Moses. Moses. Now, why is that? Well, God chose Moses to do that, but he's functioning as a mediator for the people. Moses alone is allowed to ascend to the peak. So the mountain is a, it's like it has three levels of holiness, the base, the midsection, and the top. And Moses alone is allowed to ascend to the top. Who alone is allowed to enter the Holy of Holies once a year? The high priest. So here Moses is kind of functioning in that role. He's a mediator between God and the people. He comes down the mountain to represent God to the people. He goes up the mountain to represent the people to God. So you get this interesting description in verses 9 through 11 of Moses and the elders eating on the mountain. It says, Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God, and they ate and they drank. So the, the um, part of this covenant ratification includes eating a meal with God, but they're on a portion of the mountain where they look up, and it's through this, like, this uh, barrier, this pavement, this firmament, that they see the feet of God. And what it, not that God has literal feet, but what it's communicating is that God is in the cloud at the top of the mountain, and God is resting on his throne, and where they can see from the holy place is a picture into this holy of holies where God dwells. They're under his feet, so to speak. You see that? Now, again, it corresponds to the tabernacle. In Exodus, the mountain is the tabernacle, and the tabernacle is a portable mountain because humanity needs to get back to the garden. They need to get back to the peak. Problem is, they can't because they're sinful, so they need Moses to ascend the mountain on the, of the Lord on their behalf. Look how this chapter ends. Verse 15, then Moses went up the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And, and on the seventh day, he called out to Moses in the midst of the cloud. I mean, just think about the imagery here. I think it's incredible. The cloud is covering the mountain because the cloud reveals and conceals the glory of God. He's hidden in the cloud because you don't want to look at God. You will be consumed. But it's also revealing his glory. And for six days, it says, the cloud... Uh, the glory of the Lord dwelt on uh, the cloud covered at six days and seventh day called out to Moses. Well, it's, it's an echo to the creation narrative, right? God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. It's because Moses here is a new Adam figure. Israel is God's new humanity. Israel is a microcosm of humanity. And God is bringing about his creation project to rule the world through sun priest kings in Israel. You see the connection. And Moses, at this point, is their mediator. But they are all called to be royal priests. We learn that from Exodus 19. You're a royal priesthood, a chosen nation, a people for my own possession. Right? So when God calls Israel, he's calling them back to an Adamic role, an Adamic office, where they will worship God through God's presence in the sanctuary. They will show the rest of the world what true worship looks like, and God's kingdom will come through this nation of priests, these servant kings. Okay, are the, are the connections making sense? All right, um, let's keep going. We will get to Psalm 110 eventually, but if you have this framework, it makes sense out of Psalm 110 and Hebrews. So, okay, so now we're to the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a microcosm of the cosmos. 
The cosmos is like a big tent. The tabernacle is a microcosm of the cosmos. You see there's a parallel here. Think about it even in the imagery, okay? First, God, this is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Um, he gives Moses' instructions on how to build the tabernacle in Exodus 25 through 31. You know that section of your Bible reading that you always skip? <laughs> build it this way and build it this way. It's like, oh, man, so many details. But if you read it, what you will see is that the Lord speaks seven times to Moses to tell him how to construct the tabernacle. Now, why is that important? Again, it is an echo to creation. God created the world. He spoke six times, rested on the seventh day, and created the cosmos as his tabernacle where he would fill his glory. Well, in the construction of the tabernacle, God speaks to Moses in seven speeches because the tabernacle is a microcosm of creation. So in the sixth speech from Yahweh to Moses, he tells Moses that he will fill human beings with the wisdom they need to construct the tabernacle, paralleling the sixth day of creation where God created humanity. And in the seventh speech, he gives Moses's, Moses instructions pertaining to what? Sabbath rest. So you see those parallels in the sixth and seventh day on the construction of the tabernacle to the creation of the world. Um, if you think about the cosmic symbolism of the tabernacle, you also see how it is a microcosm of creation. Again, how many sections are there to the tabernacle? Three. Three. You have the outer court um, with its, its altar and its, its bronze uh, basin for washing. The outer court corresponds to the earth. Later in Solomon's temple, the, the bronze basin would be put on these oxen, these beasts. And, you know, beasts roam the earth, right? So the outer court correlates to the created world. But then you pass into the holy place, and what do you find in the holy place? You know, off the top of your head, what's sitting in there? Show. Almost. The table of showbread? Right. Yeah? What else might you find in there? The yeah, the menorah. The, the lampstand. The mercy. The yeah, altar of incense. So you pass into this first room. And again, if you read this section on the tabernacle, this first room is made of curtains of, of uh, what colors? Well, they're blue and they're purple and they're scarlet. Okay, now when you look at the sky above, what colors do you see? Well, you see blue, you see purple, you see scarlet when the sun is setting. So as you move from the earth into the holy place, you are moving from the earth into the sky above, into, into the heavens. So you've got this lampstand that's like a little tree with light emanating against the backdrop of these blue, purple, scarlet uh, curtains, which looks like the stars in the sky. Okay, so you've got the stars in the sky in the holy place shining down their light, the sun, the moon, and the stars on what? The bread of the presence, right? Again, the details are important, but the the, the lampstand is exactly opposite of the bread of the presence, which is a table consisting of 12 loaves of bread and these basins for uh, holding drink offerings. Um, so the light from the sun and the moon and stars shines on the bread and the wine that is in the cups, right? You get the sun shining on the earth, producing grain. You get all this level of symbolism, but it's also representative of like the burning bush. You know, remember when God spoke to Moses in the burning bush? Well, this lampstand is a little tree-like bush that is shining light on the 12 tribes of Israel because they bask in the glory of God's presence as his covenant people. Now, the priests were allowed to go into the first section, so they were allowed to move from earth into the sky above and fly around in the holy place. I don't think they literally flew. Uh, but that's the picture you get of them ministering in this realm. Now, but in order to go into the third section, you have to pass through a barrier. And what is on the barrier? Thick. Yeah, it's a thick curtain. Yeah. And it's embroidered with what? Do you know? Cherubim. Cherubim, right? So in order to pass from the sky above into the heaven of heavens, you have to go through the cherubim. Because the cherubim live in the presence of God. 
So the high priest would go from earth, ascend into the sky, and then ascend into the very Holy of Holies, the dwelling place of God where he would find the Ark of the Covenant. And I don't want to spoil my sermon tomorrow, so I'm not going to give you a bunch of details about it. <laughs> Some of you will be there, and you can come if you want. Um, but what's on the Ark of the Covenant? Cherubim, right? There's cherubim on top of the Ark because you have moved from heaven to the highest heaven. You have moved into the throne room of God. God dwells in the Holy of Holies. And so what's happening on the Day of Atonement? Well, the priest is ascending symbolically into heaven because the tabernacle is a microcosm of the cosmos. But he's also entering, oh, there's a picture. Oh, that's a cool, cool picture. Should we talk about that? Oh, I forgot about that. Let's skip that. He's also um, re-entering the first mountain of the Lord, right? This is from Michael Morales' book, Who Shall Ascend the Mountain of the Lord? It's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. But he points out that the Day of Atonement celebration is like, a, it's like a, an enactment, a reenactment of humanity entering back into the Garden of Eden. So it's super compelling because when Adam and Eve are banished from the Garden, they are banished eastward, out into exile, out into death. And the cherubim are set there with the flaming sword to guard the way back into the garden. Now, if you think what's happening on the Day of Atonement, the high priest is not, not only ascending into the throne room of God, into the cloud, but he's moving from east to west back into the garden sanctuary. He's a new Adam figure. In fact, the picture I had of some of his clothes show that he's a regal figure. Now, the office of kingship was not established uh, under the Mosaic Covenant at this point in Israel's history. But his attire presents him as a regal, royal man, right? Because it's a reflection of who Adam was. So you get these purple colors, these regal colors. You get the crown on his head, which says, holy to the Lord. And then, of course, he's wearing the stones on the breastplate representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He's a, he's a new Adam a mediator on behalf of the people who is re-entering Eden on the basis of uh, sacrificial blood. So quickly, it's, yep. it's even like carvings of trees on the wall. Yes, the temple, right? yep, exactly. You get all of this garden imagery, especially in Solomon's temple, uh, all over. And it's meant to, I think, reflect the Garden of Eden. Um, so it's a pretty incredible the symbolism is absolutely incredible, right? The, the high priest had access to the presence of God one day a year on the basis of sacrificial blood. He would go in to make atonement for the sins of the people, right? He was a mediator. He represented the people to God. That's why he had the 12 stones. It's like he carried the people in on his heart as he entered into the Holy of Holies. And he represented God to the people. That's what priests do. But even the Aaronic high priest and his, uh, to make sense out of him and his responsibility, you have to situate him within the storyline of the Bible that begins at creation, okay? So we talked about that. Should I just pause here? Are there any questions before I come to Genesis 14? Now we'll back up and go back to Genesis. Just keep all that in mind because it'll help you make sense out of the book of Hebrews. That's your homework assignment. Read the book of Hebrews. We'll get there eventually. We better go quicker. OK, so before the law is ever given, before the Levitical priesthood is ever established, this guy Melchizedek appears out of nowhere in Genesis 14. Let's quickly look at that. Genesis 14. If you're familiar with Genesis 14, you know that these big bad kings from the east have, uh, are led by this kind of great king, Ketole Omar, whose name is really fun to say. Ketole Omar, I'm probably saying it wrong. Uh, he leads this coalition of kings to sweep through the land. And when they do that, they take Lot captive. That's Abraham's nephew. Well, Abraham hears about this, right? Uh, Ketole Omar has awakened to the sleeping giant. 
Abraham, and he gets 314 of his trained men, and he goes and rescues Lot, wins victory in battle against these powerful earthly kings, and then as he's returning, successful from battle, he meets this Melchizedek guy, okay, and that's in verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Keterleomar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. So the king of Sodom wants to meet with Abraham, but so does Melchizedek. And this story is really about a contrast of these two kings. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abraham, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Same language Melchizedek used, right? That I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Anur, Eskel, and Mamre take their share. There's a lot going on here, but at this time in Abraham's life, when he could have used his military prowess and success and political significance to kind of take for himself power by human means, he instead affirms his trust in Yahweh to provide and that he won't take anything from the king of Sodom, but instead Abraham identifies with this priest Melchizedek. So Melchizedek, what do we know about him in the narrative? Well, his name means king of righteousness. Melech is king, Sadak is righteousness. Uh, he's a priest of Salem, a uh, king of Salem, uh, which in Psalm 76.2, I believe it is, is identified with Jerusalem. Okay, so he's a priest king. He uh, rules over Salem, this Jerusalem, really later in the biblical narrative. And he brings Melchizedek bread and wine, which I think is significant for lots of reasons. One of them being the two key covenantal figures before Genesis 14 are who? Adam and Noah. Adam sins, by the sweat of your brow you will eat bread. Noah sins with his own vineyard where wine is made. So it's almost like Melchizedek is undoing now. God is undoing uh, what happened through Adam and Noah through his covenant with Abraham. Just an interesting aside. He blesses Abraham. He blesses Abram. I mean, that's significant. He was able to bless the recipient of the covenant promises, right? God promised that through Abraham's offspring, the nations would be blessed. And here's Melchizedek blessing Abraham, the recipient of the covenant, and giving him a meal of bread and wine, eating this covenant meal kind of together, and Abraham gives him a tithe, recognizing you could say, his superiority. In some ways, Melchizedek is a priest king like Adam. He's a worshiper of the true God, the creator God, right? And Abraham chooses to identify with Melchizedek, not worldly kingship. Worldly kingship clamors for power at the expense of others, right? Uh, give me the persons, right? That's what worldly kingship does. It lords it over others. But Melchizedekian kingship trusts God to provide the creator of heaven and earth who has blessed you, Abraham, who has given your enemies into your hand. And Abraham says, I'm not going to pursue establishing my name through my own worldly means. I'm going to trust God and in this sense stand in solidarity with Melchizedek. There's so much we could say here. The point is, I think, in Genesis that Melchizedek's significance is bound up to Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant, right? He meets Abraham before the law is ever given. Before the Mosaic covenant is ever established, you have a priest king who appears out of nowhere, and the only record we have of him in Genesis is that he appears, he ministers to Abraham, and that we don't hear anything. And that's important, as we'll see, okay? Now, David, uh, hundreds of years later, I think, was reading Genesis 14 and came to the conclusion that the Messiah would be a priest king like Melchizedek. Now, how did he come to that conclusion? That's what the book is all about. So you just need to read it 
and buy it. And if, if and I'm not, this is not uh, shameless self-promotion because I have made zero money on that book, just so you know. <laughs> I don't know, what's up with that, you know? Do all that work? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so Psalm 110 is the text we read, and I'll put all the pieces together in a second. But look at Psalm 110, it's an incredible text. I think David was reflecting on Genesis 14, the patterns of his own life, and the promises of the Davidic covenant. And through that reflection, he realized that the Messiah, his greater son, was going to be a king, and he was going to be a priest. Now, why didn't he say priest after the order of Adam? Well, because you had this priest in the biblical narrative, Melchizedek, who was associated with Abraham, who ruled from Jerusalem, and who blessed Abraham, and by extension, his offspring. And I think, Abraham, I think David recognized that, recognized his son would carry forward the promises that were made to Abraham, and that his son would be like David, ruling from Jerusalem as both a king before God and a priest, not of the tribe of Levi, because David was from the tribe of Judah. And what priesthood does that leave? Well, there's the Melchizedek priesthood. So Psalm 110 briefly says, uh, the Lord says to my Lord, so Yahweh, see the cap, capital letters, Yahweh says to my Adonai, to my Lord, this is Yahweh, what Yahweh says to my uh, offspring, to my son, to the Messiah. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So God is speaking to the offspring of David, I think it's typological, but David is saying, the Lord is going to make my offspring, this Davidic son, the highest of the kings of the earth. The right hand is the position of power and authority and rule. You're going to rule the nations. Your enemies will be made a footstool for your feet, okay? I mean, you think even of the images in our own culture of the wrestler who's just defeated his enemy and he sticks his foot on it and he's like, yeah, right? To be under one's feet is to be under his dominion. He's going to take dominion over a fallen world, whereas Adam was to take dominion over a world that was not fallen. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Again, kingship imagery. Rule in the midst of your enemies. This verse is difficult. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. In holy garments from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. If that translation is correct, uh, I think you could translate it another way. Uh, it's just saying he's going to have an army a willing army who's also going to fight on his behalf, a holy army, a priestly army. Then verse four, you, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Not after the order of Aaron, after the order of Melchizedek. What is unique about the Melchizedekian priesthood? Well, David says it right here. You just have to look at the text. You're a priest forever. Have you seen that movie Sandlot? Forever. <laughs> Forever. You are a priest. The unique thing about the Melchizedekian priesthood, as we will see from Hebrews, is that it's not grounded in the transient, temporary stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant. It is a permanent priesthood. Let's just keep going. We'll get to Hebrews. Verse 5, the Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. So the Messiah is going to conquer kings like Joshua did in the conquest. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter the chiefs, my Bible says. Does any of your Bibles say a different word than chiefs? Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's the word rosh. I think, I think it would be better if we translated it, uh, uh, he will shatter the head over the wide earth. Now, why, why, why would that matter? Yep, Genesis 3.15. I actually think what's going on here is that David is reflecting on Genesis 14, and he's recasting Ketele Omar as the kind of eschatological archenemy of God, which is Satan himself. So just as Ketele Omar conquered a broad land, but he was defeated by Abraham and Melchizedek, really, so the Messiah is going to defeat the arch enemy, the Genesis 3.15 enemy, the serpent himself, over the broad earth, right? Because Satan is a ruler of this world. So I think it's an allusion to Genesis 
Then verse 7, he will drink from the brook, by the way, therefore he will lift up his head in victory. Okay, so it's a short psalm, but, he, but it becomes so important in New Testament theology and in New Testament Christology. What is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament? Psalm 110, verse 1. It's all over. Okay, it's all over. The early church take, took great hope in this psalm. So let's fast forward to the book of Hebrews because I want to leave time for questions. I've already hinted at how some of this comes together. It's a difficult topic, the whole Melchizedekian priesthood, but Hebrews helps make it clear. Um, just turn to Hebrews 1. Let's just look how Hebrews 1 begins. Let me see if I have any slides on this. No, I just say Hebrews 1 and 2. We'll just talk about it. Hebrews is an incredible book about Jesus. You could sum it up with one sentence, you name it, Jesus is better. <laughs> Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, he spoke in the Old Testament, all these different ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Pay close attention to the language, because that's, that could be a little troubling. Was, was the, is the son, was, how do I frame the question? Is the second person of the Trinity, has he always been the son? Yes. yes. He, was a, he was appointed heir of all things. But let's think about that. We'll come back to that. Through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So he's divine, right? These are, these are attributes that belong to God alone. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Where is that language from? Sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Psalm 110, right? Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So he was appointed heir of all things, and he became superior to angels. If the son is eternally the son, if he's the one through whom God created the world, who providentially upholds all things by the word of his power, then how was he ever appointed heir of all things if he owned all things? And how did he become superior to angels if he created angels? Already. Good, question. <laughs> Good question. The reason we struggle with these questions is because as evangelical Christians, we focus almost entirely on the divinity of Christ. And we don't focus on the last Adam trajectory of who Christ is. How did he become superior to angels? Well, look at verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Verse 6. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So how does the eternal divine son, who has always been superior to everything in creation because he created everything, become superior and become heir of all things when he already owned all things. By being born? Incarnation, yeah. right? You have to, you have to understand Hebrews okay. through a incarnate Christology, an, an incarnation of the Son, right? The eternal Son who created all things, and we get into this in Hebrews too, became a little lower than the angels, incarnate, earthly life, state of humiliation. But now in that incarnate state, as the last Adam and the Davidic king, who has conquered sin and death, he rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, took his seat at God's right hand, and in his incarnate human nature has become superior to angels. In other words, dominion has been restored to humanity in the incarnate Christ. Are you putting the pieces together? So Hebrews 1 is not about Jesus' first coming. Okay, verse 6. When he brings the firstborn into the world, oikumene is the Greek word, he says, let all God's angels worship him. That is not about the um, Christmas text of the virgin birth. Oikumene, or world, is the word the author of Hebrews uses in chapter 2, verse 5. 
Now, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. The world to come. What is the world to come in Hebrews? It's the heavenly city. It's the heavenly realm. It's the eschatological world, you might say, that is presently in heaven and will one day come to earth. The eternal divine son is worthy of all glory and honor. He becomes incarnate, takes on human form, conquers sin and death, and now we almost might say is worthy of double glory and honor because of what he has accomplished in his incarnate state. And when he rose from the dead, he ascended into the heavenly realm, and God says, let the angels worship the victorious Messiah. Um, firstborn language is important in the Old Testament. Again, we hear firstborn, and what do we think? And this is where heretical religions go wrong. They think created being, first created being. That's not the way the Bible's using it. Because Exodus 4.22, who's the firstborn son of God in Exodus 4.22? Israel. Israel. Psalm 89.27, who's the firstborn son of God? The Davidic king. Hebrews, who's the firstborn son of God? Jesus. Okay, well, who gets to be first? How can they all be firstborn sons? It's not referring to created order. It's referring to supremacy, inheritance, the position of privilege, primogeniture. The firstborn was the heir, right? So when Hebrews 1.6 says he brings the firstborn into the world, it's an allusion to Psalm 89.27 where God promises David that he will make the Messiah the firstborn, and then he explains it, the highest of the kings of the earth. Jesus is the first man of the new creation. He's the firstborn from the dead. He is the first and only man to overcome death, ascend to heaven, take his seat at God's right hand, and in that incarnate human state, fulfill Adam's commission. This is made clear in Hebrews 2. Look at verse 6. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? For he made him a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. Psalm 8 is a psalm of David where David asks, what is man? And then David answers the question rightly, unlike many people in our culture who will say, well, man is a naked ape or you know, uh, uh, what are uh, bags of biology, whatever. When David asks the question, what is man? He answers by reflecting on Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Man is made in the image of God to rule creation. God, you've crowned him with glory and honor. He's the king over the earth. The author of Hebrews quotes Psalm 8 and says, guess what? That has been fulfilled in Christ, who has ascended to heaven, who is reigning from God's right hand, and who has fulfilled God's creation project for, for humanity by overcoming sin, Satan, and death. He has taken dominion over the serpent and over death itself. And he has now been crowned with glory and honor. See verse 9, we, we see him. At pre, back up to verse 8. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. That's to humanity, to us. I don't have to convince you of this, right? Have any of you gained mastery over your garage? It's hard to take dominion even over your garage, especially with six kids. Things just appear out of nowhere. <laughs> we know everything is not in subjection to us because none of us can keep ourselves from death. Right? Death still reigns over the world in that sense. But we do see him, the first man of the new creation, the first man to rise from the dead, who has subjected all things to himself, even death. And he goes on then to talk about Jesus' priesthood, which is developed in Hebrews 7. So let's just walk through this real quick, because when that guy in my neighborhood asked me, I'm supposed to ask you about Melchizedek, I told him, well, have you read Hebrews 7? And he said, no. And I said, go read Hebrews 7. And he said, OK, I will. And he read Hebrews 7. And he came back to me months later and said, I read Hebrews 7. I said, well, what do you think? He said, well, I didn't really understand it. But who really does? <laughs> Because it's really confusing, but hopefully not as confusing now, OK? Look at Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, we saw that, priest of the Most High God, 
met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. He's just commenting on Genesis, right? We saw all that in Genesis. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. We saw that in Genesis. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. Then he is also king of Salem, that is king of peace. Shalom, Salem means peace. He is without father or mother genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the son of God, he continues a priest forever. So again, I think he's just commenting on Genesis. Some people take verse 3 to, to mean that Melchizedek in the Old Testament was a pre-incarnate Christ because it says he had ne neither beginning of days nor end of life. I don't think that's what he's saying. I just think he's saying everyone in Genesis who's of significance has a genealogy. But Melchizedek in Genesis has no genealogy. We don't know this beginning of days. We don't know his end of life. We don't know his mom. We don't know his dad. And that's important because when he compares him to the Levites, the Levites had to know their genealogy to serve as priests. <coughs> Right? Notice here he doesn't say he is the son of God. He said he resembled the son of God. Okay? So Melchizedek was a human figure, but he was a type of a greater priest to come. Verse 4, see how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priest Theophilus have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people that is from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. He's saying, you see in the Genesis how we see Melchizedek is blessing Abraham, the recipient of the covenant promises. In Genesis, you see how he's superior to Abraham's offspring, the Levites. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, case tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. In Melchizedek's literary profile, the only testimony we have of him is that he lives. We don't have record of his birth or death. He just appeared and then he was gone. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Say, so that's the commentary on Genesis. Now he draws theological conclusions. Verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? The question is pretty clear. If the Mosaic Covenant and its priests could bring about complete forgiveness, salvation, why do you need another priest? That's the question he's setting up. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Make sense? The Mosaic law established the Levitical priesthood. If another priest arises of a different order, the law has to be set aside, fulfilled, right? For it is evident, or verse 13, for the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. Was Melchizedek a Levite? No. Was David a Levite? No. Was the Messiah a Levite? No. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. In connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. You see the logic. Melchizedek in Genesis, we don't know his genealogy. His priesthood was grounded, I think, in the order of creation. He appears, he's gone, we have no lineage. Jesus comes along as a priest of a different order, and what is his priesthood grounded in? The power of an indestructible life, which means what? Resurrection from the dead. His life is indestructible. He conquered death, he rises from the dead, and he is installed into an office of priesthood that is not temporary. What is unique about the Melchizedekian priesthood? You are a priest forever. You get hints of that in the Genesis narrative where Melchizedek has no genealogy. Then you get the fulfillment of that in Christ whose life is indestructible and who's installed in a priesthood of a permanent order that is superior to the Levites because his priesthood, he is able to intercede forever. Now we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 17, for it is witnessed of him you are a priest forever. You'll think of Sandlot now every time you read that. <laughs> After the order of Melchizedek, 
For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. Old covenant priests couldn't make full satisfaction for your sins. The blood of both bulls and goats could not atone for sins. It made nothing perfect, complete. It was a shadow. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. For those who were formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant, not the Mosaic covenant, a better covenant, a covenant with permanent, lasting, true blessings, full forgiveness of sins, access to the presence of God. Look how he continues, we'll wrap it up. The former priests were many in number. Well, why were they? Why were the Levites many in number? Because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. They were weak, mortal, sinful men. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Why does he continue forever? Because he rose from the dead. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost, not the mostly most, <laughs> the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He's never going to die again. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law points men in their weakness as high priest, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, points a son who has been made perfect forever. So do you see the logic? Christ's priesthood is superior. It is a permanent priesthood. It is not grounded in the stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant. It's grounded in the power of his indestructible life. And because he conquered sin, because he fully atoned for sin, because he rose from the dead, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So when I'm having conversations with people, like the man I did in my neighborhood, and I say, I'll say, did you know that Hebrews 7 says that Jesus qualified for the Melchizedekian priesthood on the basis of two things. The power of an indestructible life and the ability to save to the uttermost. He therefore has the ability to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He was sinless one. He rose from the dead. His life is indestructible. He saves to the uttermost. Can you do that? And mostly I'll just get the answer. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Which is okay because people don't think about these things. Um, if you just read Hebrews 7, where's the Aaronic priesthood now? It's over. The law has been set aside. A new priest has come. To try to say that we should install people in the Aaronic priesthood is to go backwards in redemptive history. It's to go back to the shadow now that the substance has come and undermine the Christ. To claim to be a Melchizedekian priest, I think, is misguided because Jesus qualifies it for, on the basis of his sinless sacrifice and indestructible life. And he holds that priesthood permanently. So why do you hold it as well, I would ask somebody. Can you save to the uttermost? Problems. But aren't Christians all priests? Yes. You're a royal priesthood. Why is that? Because all of this priestly discussion in the Bible begins where? With Adam. And we have been installed in Adam's office, united to the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we all have access to the throne room of God. We all have the forgiveness of sins. We are all called to minister the world, the world, the word in a dark world. And to be those agents of intercession and prayer and priestly mediation and protecting the borders of the sanctuary, which is now the new covenant temple, which is the church. And we are to take that role of Adam's assignment and royal priesthood and Israel's job as the royal priesthood seriously because Christ has won all of these privileges for us. But to go back to the old covenant, the Aaronic priesthood, is to undermine the work of Christ. To claim to hold the Melchizedekian priesthood, I think, is to claim to hold a prerogative and a priestly 
office that belongs to Christ alone. It's 1014. That was a ton of information. Let's just pause and ask for questions and see, did any of that make sense? Yes, Aaron? So what you've just done, as I understand it, is biblical theology. Yes. Tracing the line through scripture. And I grew up hearing rightly that it was really important to focus on the historical grammatical yeah. scripture. Right. scripture. Yep. So it's really important to look at the ancient Near Eastern context yeah, sure. yep. of what was written in the Old Testament. But it seems like the project of biblical theology um, treats historical grammatical readings as a kind of intro or beginning. And it, it, it's like it, it assumes that if I stay at the level of historical grammatical, yep. I'll actually miss the meaning yep. of the text. I think that's right. Because the singular divine author yep. is something that transcends yes. the meaning of That's exactly the right. Biblical theology is a hermeneutical discipline, hermeneutics is how to interpret the Bible. And the reason it's correct as an approach to reading scripture is because it takes seriously what the Bible is, which is a canon that has been written by, yes, many multiple authors in their own historical setting, in their own historical context, but by one divine author who has brought all of these material together with one story of redemption that culminates in Christ. So if we take the Bible seriously for what it is, we have to do grammatical, historical, exegesis. We have to take the literary context seriously. We have to take redemptive history seriously. And ultimately, we have to take the whole canon of scripture seriously. But if we never get there, then we're not reading the Bible the way it's intended to be read if that makes sense. And I think Melchizedek illustrates that. David interpreted Melchizedek beyond its grammatical historical setting to a typological kind of pointer to the Messiah. And then Hebrews says, yeah, and that's fulfilled in Jesus. So, uh, Bradley? I know that in um, Psalm 110, verse 3 in Septuagint, yep. it mentions beginning. And yeah. you mentioned that there was some yeah. Hebrew weirdness. Do you take the view that that should actually be a reference to? So yeah, you can take uh, the Greek word is exegenesa in Psalm 110, verse 3. Uh, you could translate the latter half of that verse, uh, from the womb of the dawn go forth, um, uh, today I have begotten you, or something like that. So I lean towards that in the uh, book. And Peter Gentry recently came out with an article arguing for the other reading. And after I was like, oh man, if Peter Gentry is arguing for the other reading, I should probably rethink that. <laughs> but um, there's compelling reasons to take it as uh, uh, I have begotten you. But I do want to reflect more on Gentry's article. I, I, heard, I heard someone say, and I forget where or when, but that there might be some Masoretic ta uh, tampering uh, with, I don't know if it's just Powell's or what, but. It, oh. that, that results in a weird reading in Hebrew, which is why the Septuagint. Yeah, I think Gentry addresses that. I can't remember all the details. But you know, even if it is, I have begotten you, it just it fits with Psalm 2. Yeah, yeah. totally. You know? And I, I meant to say this in Hebrews 1, but for example, when Hebrews 1, 5 says, to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. It's not referring to God's eternal decree. Or, or Jesus, the fact that Jesus is eternally begotten of the Father, that is true. The context is what? A s heavenly session, enthronement in heaven. So when Psalm 2 is said of Israel's king, you are my son today begotten you, what was going on is that when Israel's king was installed in the office of kingship, he was installed in this kind of covenantal relationship that Adam had with God. Represent God's righteous rule on earth. So when Jesus, Hebrews 1 says, you're my son today have begotten you, it doesn't mean there was a time when Jesus was not the eternal divine son. It means he's now fulfilled that Adamic role and that in his conquering of sin and death, he has been installed as the new Adam, this office of messianic sonship, so to speak. It's kind of like, uh, I've used this illustration, others have used it, Lord of the Rings. Um, throughout the movie, the nine hour version, it's the version we like to watch. Uh, who's the king in the story? Well, you know, it's Aragorn, right? The whole time, it's like, well, he's the king, but he's only installed as king after he defeats Sauron and those forces of evil, right? So Jesus is the eternal son, and even in his youthly life, he is the son, earthly life, he's the son of David. 
But he takes his seat in that office, that Adamic office, upon his resurrection and enthronement in heaven. So on that note, that song, that song too, yep. the today, what do you yes. think the today? I think the today uh, is referring to uh, that point in time where he uh, is enthroned in heaven. Ascension. Yep. It, it sounds like nearly all the early church fathers they, reflect on Yep, that. theologically. So yeah. as a, you know, An eternal today, decree, yep. Do you think there could be a reading where we could make the Make that argument? I think well, so. we could do both, where yeah. we have like the, the ascended today in light of yep. the eternal today? Yeah, I think so, because I think the church fathers knew what they were talking about a lot more than we give them credit for. And John Webster, he recently died, but he argues for the same thing in his essay on uh, the exordium, Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, that this is referring to kind of eternal relations. So I don't want to say that one precludes the other. I just think in terms of typology of what's going on in Hebrews 1, the clearest, most obvious explanation is that he's talking about how the divine eternal son became the messianic son. But, but you have like the messianic installed ascended sonship as the foreground. And that is the background? And, and then the eternal sonship. Yeah, you can't get away from it because like Psalm 45 example in verses 7 through 9 of Hebrews 1, but of the son he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and he's quoting Psalm 45. If you go back and read Psalm 45, it's clearly about a Davidic king who has children, right, and who's a, who's a human figure, but he's called God. I think it's part of that typology so that just as the Psalm 45 king was to represent God's rule on earth as his son, but he was only a human, by the time you get to Jesus, and that's situated in the context of Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, and you read, your throne, O God, you're meant to see, yes, this is the messianic king, but clearly within this context, he is also the divine son. He is God. And so I think the context of Hebrews 1 has both the kind of typology, but also the ontological aspect of who he is as well. You can't escape it. Uh, through whom he created the world, the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of his nature. Like he's clearly saying, who is the son? He is the divine son. He is the messianic son. Yeah. There's a kind of an, an extended meaning of the text that is connected to, but beyond what the human authorial intent yeah. had in mind. How would you? Yeah, I would just say um, the Bible. All everything I'm saying is actually grounded in the human authorial tent of the authors in the Old Testament. But now that the mystery, what's that? Not reductive to. It. Yeah, exactly. So like Psalm two is. Uh, clearly talking about a Davidic Messiah. I'll put you on my Zion, my holy hill. I think I am actually doing justice to the kind of grammatical, historical, author intended meaning uh, aspect of that text without just imposing divinity on it. In other words, I'm not going to say, well, yeah, Psalm 2 here is just saying, oh, the son is going to be, the, the Messiah is divine. You see what I'm saying? Whereas I feel like dispensationalism, in order to make sense of that, almost has to do that. Whereas I'm saying, no, it's actually referring to human sonship. It's actually referring to human kingship. And typologically, that is fulfilled in the human incarnate Christ. But there's also a heightened sense to it because we come to discover that the new Adam is actually God himself. And that becomes your theological reading of Psalm 2. Exactly. It's yeah. a good question. That's hard stuff. Yes? It's more related to application, I yeah. guess. I can see how this is very important. That was yeah. an excellent uh, presentation, by the way, for me. I learned a lot um, related to where we live here. Yes, yeah. But I was wondering how with the, the restoration that Christ has brought yep. and the dominion of right. man. Yeah, good I'm, question. I'm thinking within the context of Christianity. Yeah because it seems where we get off a lot is a distortion of that authority or dominion. Yep. Um, and, and our churches are right. going in many directions right. based on that Yeah, distortion. it's a great question. Yep. And so what, what would you recommend as some key yeah. balance? Ba applications of that. Yeah, I think the, the kind of royal priestly prerogative of Adam uh, that is now ours is fulfilled primarily in 
our roles and responsibilities in the church. So I don't think we're meant to take that and say, okay, this guarantees that we will conquer kingdoms or should take up the sword, for example. Um, because I think there's three jurisdictions of authority in the world, the state, the keys in the church, and then the rod in the family. And it seems to me like we have been now installed in Adam's office as this royal priesthood to protect the, the, the borders of the sanctuary, which is what? The new covenant church. So as a priestly people, we are called to um, practice, for example, and uphold church discipline. In other words, we need to make sure the gospel is being preached in our own churches. We need to take responsibility to make sure serpentine false gospels aren't coming into the garden, into the church. We need to make sure serpentine false gospels are being driven out of the church. We need to exercise our authority to declare the true gospel, to recognize who citizens of Christ's kingdom are. Um, and we need to exercise that priestly authority also to intercede on behalf of the nations, to pray for one another, to minister the word to one another. So I think this is a responsibility that now belongs to all of Christ's new humanity because we have all been now given that vocation. And when Christ comes again, we will indeed reign with him on a larger scale as a kingdom and priest to God over the earth. But right now, uh, we have limits to our jurisdiction and our authority, and I think it's to be manifested within church authority and jurisdiction. Which is why, when I went on a tour of uh, one of the Mormon temples here with a former bishop, and we talked all about temples and priesthood, and we got to the end of it, and he said, well, then, Matt, who holds the priesthood today? He said, what about in the Gospels where Jesus laid his, hand on, his hands on the apostles and transferred the priesthood to him? And I said, well, where does it say that in the Gospels? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, because it's not there. And I said, but who holds the priesthood today? I said, everyone who believes in Christ and who is united to him by faith. Right? And so we all have these responsibilities now and these privileges of access to God, of every blessing of the new covenant, and the empowerment to minister the gospel in a fallen world. Yeah, Daniel. You almost have to take a step further, though, with the, um, the, still the understanding of priesthood, because even when you get into that discussion, you, you still have how that's being played out in a Mormon context. Right, versus, yeah, it gets, yeah. Versus the biblical context. Yeah. Uh, it's quite different. Yeah, they have all kinds of ordinances that are attached to those priestly powers. Um, and so, yeah, it's just trying to, it's just trying to take any angle you can to understand these issues and how you might talk about it with, you know, wherever someone is at in terms of their biblical and spiritual understanding. So, good questions. I have three minutes left. Any? It, it also helps a lot with talking to Catholics. Yeah, sure. There's, there's a lot of priest stuff. Yeah, there. so there would be, yeah, differences in terms of Roman Catholicism, Anglicanism in terms of uh, priestly authority and whatnot. Um, but yeah, we all have to uh, uh, wrestle with these things and kind of put the Bible together as a whole to then draw theological conclusions, so. It's interesting if you give up on typology, yep. the prefiguring of things to come in the events of people in the Old Testament. If you give that up, um, you start asking, well, where was Christ in the Old Testament? Right. And in Mormonism, because they don't have a trust in any sort of typology or a sort of a uh, deeper substantial spiritual meaning of the text or divine author, yep. um, they have to say, well, Christ was in the Old Testament explicitly, explicitly. Yep. and then taken out and put in a Preston Shrewsbury. Right. Yeah, you have to get there a whole different way. Whereas I didn't have time to do it. I'm, I was trying to show in Hebrews 1 the way the author of Hebrews is interpreting the Old Testament based on this whole kind of trajectory of the kingdom of God coming through human uh, mediators, so to speak. So when you understand that whole big picture, then you can understand how Christ is all over the Old Testament as a shadow, as, a, as pointing to him, as a type, as a pattern, right? I mean, it really, and we see this all in human history. Uh, our best stories are really biblical stories. Like I could, I've, I, told, I, I think I told our church this once in a class, but you could tell the story. I mean, one of my kids' favorite shows is about a story of a king who has a son, who this son is meant to have dominion over the land, but there's this serpentine figure who takes control and the son of the king is driven out into the death of exile. 
but he comes out of the death of exile and returns to the land, which is now under a curse. But when he comes back, he defeats the serpentine figure and the new creation commences. And do you know what that is? It's the story of the Lion King. <laughs> <laughs> Go re watch it again. It's incredible <laughs> to think about. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, in Hebrews, you know, it says, come boldly before the throne right, of Christ. Yeah. We, right. we have this high priest, and we know when he, when he was crucified that the curtain into the Holy of Holies was torn. Ripped. Exactly. I mean, the yep. heavy duty curtain and all, right. and we were granted access. But as you spoke, I felt so strongly that it, it, uh, I, I thought about in the, in the garden how he came looking. For Adam right. and Eve. Yep. And I always thought, oh, we're going into him. But really, it's That's exactly priest right. who came to us. To us, exactly. And he tore, he tore the curtain. And he yep. still is coming to us. He's the as great a high yep. priest. And That's exactly and right. I, I loved that picture of, of him. Yeah, he's. It, no matter how old we are in Christ. That's exactly right. He's been enthroned above the cherubim now. And he's sending out the Spirit to lay hold, Hebrews 2.16 of the offspring of Abraham. So he's gathering the offspring of Abraham right now from across the nations as their Melchizedekian priest. It's really incredible. This is a great gospel, a great salvation. We need to stop. So I'll say a prayer. And then, Eric, is there anything you want to say? No, after we're done, if you want to go to the back table and if people want to talk to you there, okay, you great. buy the books, you can do that. All right. And, uh, okay. Feel free to hang around. Sounds great. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Bible. Lord, we will never exhaust uh, knowing it all in a single lifetime, in many lifetimes, uh, forever, Lord. There's just so much riches to be contained in the scriptures. I pray that whatever is useful in this class, that you would help us to retain those things, whatever is not useful, or that we would just move on better equipped uh, to serve you, uh, to minister the gospel to others, and Lord, to be moved towards the worship of the one true and living God who has accomplished our salvation and brings us back into your presence. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.